In general, I think that it's challenging for women to know and also acknowledge that their relationship with alcohol might not be a healthy one. I recently had the chance to sit down with San Francisco Bay Area therapist, Emily Scoville, who shared her unique experience as a practitioner, as a therapist, how the past few years have impacted not only women's mental and behavioral health, but how it has also affected workplaces, families, and communities as a whole. Please join me as we listen to what she had to say. In general, I think that it's challenging for women to know and also acknowledge that their relationship with alcohol might not be a healthy one. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this, uh, one of the main reasons is because our culture completely normalizes, rationalizes um, the maladaptive use of alcohol. And we know that, the, that our, you know, women are targeted. Um, and we saw this a lot during the pandemic uh, with Wine Moms and Rosé all day. And I think it really started to, to seep in into the lives of a lot of women and kind of like a slow burn. And so for it in my practice, what that might look for, like for somebody is um, maybe pre-pandemic, they limited alcohol use to weekends, special occasions. Now this became, you know, drinking became more frequent and maybe in larger amounts as well. And it wasn't used for, you know, pleasure, but it was actually used to cope with the stressors of the pandemic. So that's one way that people were sort of recognizing, wow, my relationship with alcohol has changed. For other people, it might have um, been that they were having issues within their relationships or problems with their health. So that could look like difficulty sleeping, um, increased anxiety, increased depressive symptoms and work issues. So just like we sort of lost this work-life boundary during the pandemic, I think we also lost boundaries with things like alcohol um, as well. What I like to do is the first step is really to provide a safe, contained, validating environment. I think it's really hard for anyone to kind of say that they have a problem with something. So that takes a lot of courage. So I want to be, you know, be able to provide that space. Next is I, it's really important, I think, to assess the relationship with the substance. So how has it impacted this person's life? So has it impacted their relationships? Has it impacted personal or work, their health? Has it impacted their safety, their finances? I mean, the list sort of goes on. Um, and then I also like to know what purpose has this substance serve? Um, is there something co-occurring, some other co-occurring mental health condition that is also this, this substance is, is trying to manage? Um, and I also would like to know what things has the, the client patient tried to do to manage this relationship. And then lastly, I wanna know what changes the client wants to make within this relationship. And then from here, we can collaboratively come up with a treatment plan, how to address um, this depending on what the client's goals are. Um, and, and, and so this might look like giving them various resources. It could look like individual therapy. So maybe some evidence-based interventions like CBT, DBT, EMDR, um, motivational interviewing, um, or it might look like and or a medication evaluation. So that would be a referral to a psychiatrist or a primary care physician, because I think sometimes um, medication for some can set the stage to be able to to implement these interventions or these tools that you learn in, in, in therapy. And then for others, uh, it might look like group. Um, some might take a harm reduction approach, some might do a more abstinence-based model. So it really is client patient specific. Before COVID, I was really not keen on teletherapy. I had pretty firm boundaries around face-to-face -face therapy. Um, so COVID was a forcing function for me to provide it. Um, it was and is a necessity now. Um, 
So it was very important. It was essential for me to maintain and continue care with my clients. So I'm very thankful for this technology in this way. And it was a learning for me as a clinician because it opened it opened my mind. Like that it's not, you know, we can practice in other ways. We need to meet our, our patients and clients where they are. So now I have a, pretty much a hybrid uh, practice. I worked within a 12-step abstinence-based model, which means um, completely abstaining from substances. And this comes from the belief that a person can't manage their use. And I think this works really well for many people, but I also found it to be limiting for many pa patients as well, and for different reasons. Um, many of the clients that I work with patients at that time were also mandated to treatment and we're addressing co-occurring disorders. So it was really unfortunate that there were not other options like a harm reduction model, which, which gives a client more control and agency based on their goals and what they want for their lives. And now um, this is really a common, common in my practice, the more harm reduction model. Um, I think at the time, because of lack of resources, um, this was not an option for you know, the women that I was serving um, at this recovery center, unfortunately. Um, but again, some really took to the abstinence-based model. I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all approach, but I think for others, having alternatives can be really helpful because I think when we have choice, we feel empowered as humans. And when we feel empowered, I think we're more motivated to make changes in our lives.